Greetings students and welcome back to another lesson about complex variables. In this video we're going to learn about local inverses in conformal mappings. Recall from my previous video on conformal mappings that the function f of z is said to be a conformal mapping or conformal transformation if the angles between curves in the z-plane are equal to the angles between curves in the transformed w-plane. In other words, a conformal mapping is a mapping in which there is a preservation of angles locally at a point of interest. In other words, the angle in the z-plane conforms to the angle in the w-plane. Recall also that in order to have a valid conformal mapping at z0, the complex function corresponding to the transformation must be analytic at z0, so nice and differentiable. In addition, the value of the derivative of the function at z0 must not be zero. If these conditions are satisfied, f of z is a conformal mapping at z0. What we're going to talk about in this video are local inverses. A complex function f of z that is conformal at z0 automatically has a local inverse at z0. What this means is that if I've got a transformation that takes me from the z-plane to the w-plane given by w equals f of z with f of z0 equal to w0, then this transformation has a unique inverse transformation that takes me back from the w-plane back to the z-plane. And I can write this inverse transformation as z equals g of w, where this g of w is defined and analytic in a neighborhood of w0. The other important points about this inverse function, this g of w, is that at w0, g of w maps back to z0. So just like how f of z maps me from z0 to w0, g of w does the opposite and maps me back from w0 to z0. That's why it's an inverse transformation. In addition, if I take any complex number in the w-plane that is in the neighborhood n where g of w is analytic around w0, and I run that complex number through the transformation g, and if I then run the result of that through f, I get my original complex number back. So if I retransform an inversely transformed complex number, I get back my original complex number, which hopefully should make intuitive sense. The other property I should mention of this local inverse g is that if I take the derivative of g with respect to w, then that derivative is the reciprocal of the derivative of f with respect to z. This should make intuitive sense. Why is that? Well, w is just f of z, so df by dc is basically just dw by dz. In addition, z is just g of w, so dg by dw is the same as dz by dw. So if we plug this into our rule up here, we just end up with dz by dw equal to the reciprocal of dw by dz, which is basically a true statement for single variable differentiable functions. So now that we've covered the preamble, I'm going to show that this w equals f of z, which is conformal at z0, indeed has a local inverse. So let's start with this proof. Because f of z is conformal, f must be analytic at z0. That's one of the conditions for a conformal mapping if you go up to near the top. And if f is analytic at z0, it must be analytic in some neighborhood of z0 by definition of an analytic function. Let's now suppose that I have a complex number z equal to x plus yi that belongs to this analytic neighborhood of z0, which is given by x0 plus y0 i. In terms of the real and imaginary parts, I can write my function f of z as a function u of x and y plus a function v of x and y times my imaginary number. So basically, this function is a transformation from the z-plane or the xy-plane, same thing, to the w-plane or the uv-plane. And the equations transforming the x and y to the u and v are as follows. I'll call these equations 1. Now, according to the inverse function theorem from analysis slash calculus, a multivariable vector-valued function is invertible in a region if the determinant j of the Jacobian matrix, which is also called the Jacobian, is non-zero in that region. And of course, the Jacobian matrix for this two-dimensional function system with the u and v is given by the following elements, consisting of various partial derivatives of u and v with respect to x and y. From basic matrix analysis, the determinant of a 2x2 two two matrix is the product of the main diagonal elements minus the product of the opposite diagonal elements. Now, recall from way back in my original complex analysis series the cauchy raymond relations. These relations, which are valid in a region when we're looking at a function that is analytic in that region, state that the partial derivatives of u with respect to x and y are equal to the partial derivatives of v with respect to y and the negative partial of v with respect to x, respectively. 
If we plug these into the expression for our determinant, the determinant just becomes the sum of squares of the partial of u with respect to x and the partial of v with respect to x. And this sum of squares is in fact equal to the modulus squared of the derivative of f with respect to z. Now you might wonder how I got to this conclusion. Well, let me go on the side to explain. Remember that f of z is an analytic function. It's complex, differentiable, or holomorphic. And if I have a holomorphic function, it must be differentiable in all directions. If I approach f of z from the top, the derivative has to be the same as if I approach f of z from the bottom, the right, the left, and so on. So I'll use the definition of the derivative df by dz as the limit as h approaches 0 of f of z plus h minus f of z over h. And I can suppose that my h, instead of just being a generic complex number, is restricted to being a real number. So all I'm doing is finding the derivative of f in the horizontal direction. But because f is already analytic, then this really makes no difference, because the derivative in the horizontal direction should be equal to the derivative in the vertical direction, or any diagonal direction you want to choose. Now, if I plug my f in terms of u and v, that means I'm only concerned about the derivatives of the u and v in the x direction, because that is the real or the horizontal direction. So that's why I'm only adding h to the x and the u and the v, because I'm only going horizontally on the complex plane. Now, if I break up this limit into its real and imaginary parts, I get the following. And if you examine each of these individual limits, you'll see that they both represent the partial derivatives of u and v with respect to x by definition. So that means I can write my derivative df by dz as the sum of the partials of u and v with respect to x, of course with the imaginary number multiplying the v term. And therefore, the modulus squared of f is just the sum of squares of the partials of u and v with respect to x. And that's how, if we go back to here, that's how we got from this step to this step. Now what this means is that if I want my Jacobian to be non-zero for my function to be locally invertible at z0, that means that the modulus of f prime squared must be non-zero. And if the modulus of f prime squared cannot be zero, this just means that df by dz cannot be zero at z0. But since f is a conformal mapping at z0, I've already guaranteed myself that I'll get a non-zero derivative at z0 because that's a condition for a conformal mapping. And therefore, if I have a function that is conformal at z0, then that function automatically has a local inverse at z0 just by virtue of it being conformal. So that means I've proven my theorem that a conformal mapping automatically has a local inverse at the point. What does this inverse look like? Well, I can again write it as the function z equals g of w, where g of w is given by x plus yi, where x and y are both functions of u and v. Now these functions of u and v given by x and y are also continuous, and their partial derivatives can be written in terms of the partial derivatives of u and v with respect to x and y as follows, where of course j is the Jacobian, the determinant of the Jacobian matrix for the original function f of z, so not for the inverse function. Now you might wonder where these formulas for the partials of x and y come from. Let me show you how. Recall that for a 2 by 2 matrix M equal to A, B, C, D, the inverse is given by 1 over the determinant of M times this matrix, where the D and A are switched and the B and C become negative. So using this rule, the inverse of the Jacobian matrix is given by the following. But the inverse Jacobian matrix is the same as the Jacobian matrix of the inverse transformation, which I'm going to call equation 2. So for the transformation from the variables u and v to the variables x and y. And what's the Jacobian matrix for the inverse transformation in equation 2? Well, it's just given by these partial derivatives stacked together. And since this matrix and this matrix are equal, their corresponding elements are all equal. And that's how we got these four partial derivative equations up here. So in the end, we've shown that for a function that qualifies at a conformal mapping at a particular point, that same function has a valid local inverse at that point. And so that should do it for this video. I'd like to thank the following patrons, and if you enjoyed the lesson, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.